Okay, so what is this paper all about? It, first of all, it's about distributed systems. And uh, this is the first paper we've had, yeah. had that talks about distributed systems. And the interesting thing, there are two interesting things about distributed systems. One of them is one that we've already started to work on, which is concurrency. If you're gonna have a bunch of machines, then obviously they're gonna execute their instructions in parallel. So the, you can't avoid the concurrency. I should have put a third thing in here too. There's also communication cost. This is increasingly true in more centralized systems as well, but in distributed systems, you have to pay a lot more attention than you might be accustomed to in a single machine system to the fact that, you know, that for one, System, one part of the system to communicate with another part, there's going to be a significant and in many cases an overwhelming cost. So you, you tend to work much harder on controlling the communication costs. Now, as, as uh, of course, it's true that as systems have evolved, the, um, this, even a single chip system looks much more like a distributed system from this point of view because it costs um, many hundreds of instructions worth of execution time to take a single cache miss. Um, and it's also true that in many contexts, especially in data centers, the uh, communication cost between machines has been um, worked on very hard for several decades and has been brought down to the level where you can send some interesting number of bytes from one machine to another and get a response within a fairly small number of microseconds if you're careful. But still, it's an important issue. And the third thing about distributed systems, of course, is you have to be able to deal with partial failures. It's generally considered to be against the rules to say that if one part of the distributed system fails, you'll shut the whole thing down and restart it. And there's obvious uh, sort of practical reasons having to do with the fact that you, you'd like to have availability um, for that. But, but part of it is, I think, is also is religion. Uh, it just seems wrong to shut the whole collection of independent machines down to, just because one of them has failed. Oh, more people have showed up. That's great. <clears throat> so the, the distinctive thing to my mind about the Iron Fleet system is not just that they're working on distributed systems or that they're working on concurrency or that they're working on failures, but that they've put a lot of effort into building a, a verified distributed system that's practical in, in the yeah. sense that it has reasonably good performance. And they, they offer some, um, perhaps not 100% convincing, but 90% convincing uh, data in the evaluation section that very roughly speaking, it says that they're paying a factor of two for everything that they've done to make a, make a verified system. <clears throat> and, they're, and, and they've illustrated the paper anyway with two highly non-trivial uh, examples. One of them is a, Paxos-based replicated state machine system. And the other is a, a key value store that is capable of, of doing rebalance and uh, sh shifting the responsibility for some of the keys from one machine to another. So what's their, what's their um, grand story? It's a three-level story. Well, wait a minute, is that right? No, it's a five-level story. <clears throat> At the top, as we're uh, all very familiar, there's a spec. And the ground rules for the spec are, are taken straight out of Leslie Lamport's playbook. Uh, you ignore the fact that the system's distributed. You write a single, a God's eye view specification. And the slightly uh, puzzling feature about this specification, which I don't claim to be able to completely and convincingly explain is that it includes a spec relation, which is a little bit more than a garden variety abstraction relation because it actually defines what's visible. Then they split things into the two big parts. One part says we've got host machines that execute actions atomically possibly very complicated actions atomically. That is during the, very loosely speaking, during the execution, they don't interact with any other machines. 
and the code within a single host is, is run sequentially. And then on top of that, they have a, a, what they call a protocol layer. So that, that's layer, that's level two in, in, on this slide. On top of that, they have what they call a protocol layer. Um, and the idea of the protocol layer is we've got these hosts. Oh, why did it do that? Oh, I see it did that because I pushed the wrong button. Now, why is it doing that? What am I doing wrong? Uh, Better. Oh dear, I guess we're not going to be drawing pictures because this is very distracting. Um, on top of the host layer, and I've drawn two hosts in little boxes here, there's a protocol layer. The hosts communicate with each other by sending messages from one host to another. And this is where all the concurrency comes in and also the, the uh, fault tolerance, if there is any fault tolerance, which there certainly is in the replicated state machine example. So at this level, you have to, as I say, you have to worry about concurrency, you have to worry about failures. Um, on the other hand, to make life easier at this level, level uh, you get to do things you know, very abstractly. You get to work with unbounded integers, unbounded sets and sequences, the messages of unbounded size and so forth. And all the work of making those things, of actually implementing those, the, as much of the properties of those things as you actually need is put into the host layer where you get to do sequential reasoning. <clears throat> so in the host layer, which I've called PH here, consists in the familiar fashion of atomic actions um, rep represented by the host next predicate, which tells you how to get, get from state S to state S prime. And these are actions that the S Consists of, consists of the host state and the network state. The network is just modeled by a set of messages and doesn't have any actions of its own. All, all of the, the um, changes to the network state are, are made by the host actions. Then you have to, of course, you have to have an abstraction function from the, from the protocol state to the spec state. And you're gonna do the proof uh, uh, in TLA slash plus cal style by just basically by defining, um, by finding an invariant and proving that it's maintained by every step that a host can take. So the game here is to try to push all the complexity introduced by communication and concurrency and failures into a place where you don't simultaneously have to worry about implementation constraints. Because as you can see, basically there are no implementation constraints at the at this protocol level. The only constraint is that the hosts have to take atomic actions, and you have to define those those actions in such a way that you can actually prove at the host level that they are atomic. Okay, so that's the protocol level. Hosts taking atomic actions and communicating by host to host messages. Then. At the host level, you have single host atomic actions, which are for the most part described by imperative code, which you can then reason about using more or less garden variety sequential reasoning. And the one wrinkle on that is that in order to put this together with the protocol level, you're gonna to have to show that the host actions really are atomic. And the basic technique for doing that is the one that we studied um, to some extent in the lecture I gave about concurrency and in much more detail in the, uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we read the Armada paper. And it's not surprising that um, this paper and the Armada paper both put heavy reliance on reduction since they're written by basically the same people. So in the familiar refinement story, you have to show that the host code refines the host spec that we wrote down at the protocol level using an abstraction function. 
in a minute, let me get out of this. Right, so the host code, it's fighting me tooth and nail. There we go, no? All right, we'll just use the mouse. Um, <clears throat> so the, it's, it, it's the familiar story. You've got uh, a, you know, a, neck, you know, a ch next, predicate that defines the actions at the code level. And you have to show that that implies the pH-next action definition, which tells you what can happen at the, at the host spec level, which is up here. And you have an abstraction function that maps the host state represented by C for code to the, the host code state, to the host spec state in the familiar way. And you have to show that the, every action that the host can take concretely is um, an action that, that the, when you map it up by the abstraction function that the spec could take. And similarly, of course, for the init, but that's usually much easier. So in the Iron Fleet story, the code for each host action is purely sequential and usually deterministic. They don't actually talk about it a non-deterministic host code, I think. Okay, so we've, that, we've talked about the protocol, we've talked about the host, what about the network? Uh, the concrete network is just represented by UDP packets. And um, the trick that they use to reason about the network is to keep a ghost variable, which is a journal of all the packet sends and receives that have occurred. And that allows you to, um, yeah, that basically says everything there is to say about what's happened in the network yeah. <clears throat> and allows you yeah. to reason about yeah. any aspect of it that you need to. Then you put n of these individual hosts that we did in step two together with the network. Yeah. And now you have a distributed system who, yeah. and you have to show that that refines not just the, the, the pH uh, spec, but the entire P spec. And then finally, you show that this distributed system is actually refining the original spec, which fundamentally you do by composing P refines S and D refines P. Since refinement is transitive, you, you compose the two abstraction functions and that gets you from D all the way up to S. And the P to S abstraction function define, is defining effectively defining the external visibility. So to make this a little bit more concrete, they give an example, which I have recoded here somewhat more compactly. Um, so the example here is one of a distributed lock, which can be held by exactly one host at a time. And there's no fault tolerance in this example. So the abstract state, there's just, there's a variable, which is a sequence of host IDs, which tells how the lock is, been handed off from one host to the next. So every time a new host acquires the lock, uh, you add an, uh, an entry for that host onto the end of this held sequence. So it starts out just having some one of the hosts holding the lock because you have to have a way to get started. You pick a host arbitrarily to hold the lock. And then the only action in this spec says that you choose a new host to get the lock next and you tack its ID on the end of the, of the held history. So that's the spec. <clears throat> and the host that currently holds the lock is the, is the last guy on the, on the held history. So how are we gonna implement that? This is not a very sophisticated implementation, um, but the idea is, whoops, I didn't read that comma. Um, the idea is we're gonna have packets in, in the network and the packets are gonna consist of a source ID and an, and an integer. And, and you should think of the integer as being the, the index into this held sequence. That is, the, it, it tells, you know, tells you what's going on for the end transition of, the, of who holds the lock. 
And then we're gonna, the, the, the state consists of a variable called the network, which has two sets of packets, one for transfer operations and one for acquire operations. And not the somewhat weird um, way in which this spec is written. Um, when you want to transfer, there, there, there's two actions involved by the host in transferring the lock from one host to another. The first action, in the first action, one host grants the lock by issuing a packet that says, hey, here's the lock, come and get it. And the second host uh, receives the packet and now it's holding the lock. And, and to make it crystal clear that it's holding the lock, it spits out another packet, which just says, I've got the lock. So that's the acquire packet into the, in, in the second part of the network state. And the just, obviously in real life, you wouldn't spit out another packet when you acquire the lock. The purpose of this is to make it easy to um, write an abstraction function from here up to the up to the spec because you can just look around for acquire packets. And so what is the abstraction function? It says for every packet yeah. that's that's been a that represents an acquire, um, the source field for that packet must be the same as the guy who was as the ID of the host that, yeah. that the spec says is currently holding the lock. <clears throat> I think this minus one is a mistake actually. So the way things go, if you've got the lock and yeah. you're at, and you're, so you've got the lock and your state is, is N, suppose N is 10. You can issue a, a, a transfer packet, which says, um, here I am, I, I had the lock at, at stage step N, and now I'm handing it off. Now you don't hold the lock anymore. And if it, if the, some later time, somebody will receive this transfer packet. Um, sorry. If, you are, if your value is n, the packet you issue has n plus one in it, in it because this is gonna be the next, uh, the next um, transition of the lock from one host to another. So when, when you receive this, this transfer packet, the receiving host sets its uh, n value to the value in the packet. And then it spits out an acquire packet that says, I got it. Which, which contains, which also contains the n. So that's the idea. So what's the invariant variant between this jumble of, of host states and packets and the very simple spec that yeah, just consists of a sequence of, of IDs? So the answer is, you, you um, look at the set, which is the, the um, all the hosts for whose lock value is, is true, which, of which there should be exactly one. You ask what's the size of that set and you set ID to the size of that set. So that tells you how many hosts currently have lock equal to true. And then M is the maximum uh, N value in any of the hosts. So I is the number of hosts that, that are holding the lock and M is the maximum N value. And the invariant says that I, I is less than or equal to one. So the number of hosts holding the lock is either zero or one. And if it's zero, then there must be a packet in the transfer network whose N is equal to M plus one. And when this packet is received, um, the receiving host's lock variable field will become true. I will go from zero to one. This won't count anymore. But now there'll be a, a uh, now there'll be a host that is holding the lock. So this part will be true. Sorry, I will be equal to one, not equal to zero anymore. So we don't need this part. Okay. So 
the spec was this really simple notion that just tells you what, what the sequence of hosts is. And the invariant tracks the migration of the lock from hosts to packets to receiving hosts. A little diversion on the subject of lock invariance, which is not really relevant, directly relevant to this paper, but it's important to understand. Um, the original motivation for locks was the idea that you can make a, um, a sequence of actions that mess around with a set of variables atomic by holding a lock that protects all the variables. But it's important, very important to understand that atomicity is not enough. If you're try, trying to make a, some action A atomic, the action is gonna have a precondition and a postcondition. And that's exactly what the lock invariant gives you. And you need an invariant, not just a precondition and a postcondition. And why is that? The reason is that you know, yeah. preconditions and postconditions are, excuse me, <coughs> preconditions and postconditions are fine as long as you're doing sequential reasoning because the postcondition of step I does, stays, around, stays around to be the precondition of step I plus one. But that's not true in, when you're reasoning concurrently because after step I has taken place, um, step I pl plus one isn't necessarily sequential. And by the time the next action whose precondition needs to be satisfied comes along, um, the, the, the state may have changed because of other intervening actions that you don't have that much control over. And the whole point of an invariant is that whenever you're not holding a lock, you have to maintain the invariant. And the benefit you get in return for that is that when you acquire the lock, you, you, can, you know that the invariant is true. So the invariant acts as both the precondition and the postcondition for each one of these atomic actions that's protected by the lock. <clears throat> Now with state machine, and this, this is something that requires a certain amount of extra machinery in the context of, of reasoning about with Hoare triples or weakest preconditions or whatever, which after all you know, were built to work well in the sequential situation. With state machines, there's nothing particularly special about the lock invariant. It's just one of the conjuncts of the global invariant. Remember, when you, the only way you can actually systematically prove anything in the state machine world is to show that there's a global invariant that's maintained by every action. And this is just one, yeah. one special case of that. It has to be a, con the, the lock invariant is gonna be a conjunct of the global invariant that's gonna say that it must hold whenever the PC is outside of a critical section. When, when you're inside the critical section and holding the lock, the invariant could be something more complicated. So that's the basic idea behind lock invariants. And you need, as I said, you need a fair amount of machinery, which, which um, Tej was explaining in the context of Iris, to make this work in the, in that world. But you don't need any special machinery to make it work, in the state machine world. Okay. So maybe we'll hold off on this one. So probably the biggest single piece of machinery in Ironfleet, which is also the biggest single piece of machinery in Armada, and that we also saw as the biggest single piece of machinery when we were reasoning about locks, is that if actions commute, they can move in the, in the history, in the trace. <clears throat> so in the case of locks, our idea was um, how does a reduction work for locks? Remember, the basic idea of reduction is you start with um, a bunch of interleaved actions from, from several different threads. And what you're gonna do is commute those actions around so that all, all the actions that, that a single thread is taking to, to do something atomically are next to each other with no intervening actions. And then you can do sequential reasoning on those actions, on those, on those uh, sub-actions of the, of the atomic action. So for locks, the basic idea for this is if you have two actions that conflict, then they don't commute. Sorry. If you have two non-commuting actions, then they have to be protected by a, a lock that conflicts so that only one thread can hold that lock at a time. 
which guarantees that you won't be have, have any other threads introducing one of these non-commuting actions into your into your sequence. So you're going to have an A action, an A action, a B action, an A action, a C action, and so forth. But this is going to turn this into the B action, the three A actions, and then the C action, because you're going to be able to commute the B action before the A actions and the C action after the A actions, or actually the way you're supposed to say that is you're going to commute the A actions to the right over the B actions, and you're going to com commute the, whoops, we wanted to see that, we wanted to see the other way around, sorry. You're going to commute the A action to the left over the C action, and then you're going to have the three A actions together, so you can reason about them atomically. And the, after you've released the lock, of course, conflicting actions are possible. So if, if uh, for example, this is a release, then the non the the non commuting C might be a non commuting commuting action. But in that case, C could couldn't be occurring in here because in this whole interval, you're holding the lock, which means that no no non commuting action can 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 run. They're, all the non-commuting actions are going to be disabled because they're going to be waiting for the lock. Okay, in the uh, iron fleet world, we don't have locks, but we have messages. So what's the idea for, of reduction for messages? It's very similar to the idea for locks. It's a specialization of the story about lots of right movers, some non-mover, and then lots of left movers. So in the case of the messages, the notion is you're going to have three kinds of actions, receive actions, which correspond to receiving a message, process to actions, which are internal actions of a single host, which are operating entirely on the host's internal variables. So they definitely commute with everything else <clears throat> because, because there's no variables shared. Um, send actions and possibly um, this, this um, mysterious read time action, which is, does not have the property. It's not like a process action, even though it doesn't involve the network, because it does involve another communication channel, which is real time. So receive actions and process actions are going to be right movers. So you can do as many of them as you want up to the non-mover, which is the read time action. And then send and process actions are going to be left movers. So the idea you're going to have here is you've got um, some receive action, some third party action, some process action, some other receive action, the time action, and then um, some send actions. And we're going to make this equivalent to, we're going to move the receive actions and the process actions to the right because they're right movers. So we're going to skip over the C and we're going to skip over, sorry, no. And we're, then we're going to have R, P, R, then the T action, which is not a mover, and then a send action. And then we're going to move the other send action over these two. So we're going to have a second send action, and then we're going to have C, and then we're going to have D. And now we've managed to put all the uh, actions that are part of one host together. And so this can be, we can reason about this sequence atomically. And I just want to point out sort of, before we go into the detail, details of why we should believe this, um, it should be intuitively clear that some rule like this one, which limit, you know, limit the, the, sequence, the way in which you can communicate from within one atomic host action, some rule like this is going to be essential because if you don't have some constraint, then you could you know, you just hey have an external, another host that's acting as a memory and you could do read and write actions on that other host 
and you could simulate um, ordinary execution, ordinary non-distributed sequential, ex sorry, concurrent execution. And we know that uh, uh, you, you don't have atomicity under those circumstances. So some form of, some rule like this is gonna be absolutely essential. <clears throat> so let's understand how this is gonna work. Um, my, my P action and, and P, R, or S actions from any other thread are gonna commute. So P is a both mover. You can skip over other actions of any kind from some other thread. Why is that? It's because the P action acts only on local variables of this host. Receive actions commute with other receive actions and send actions commute with other send actions because it doesn't make any difference what order the, the packets are sent in. But for receive and send, there's a one-way relationship. If, you, if um, host A does a receive and then host B does a send, yeah, that, that must be yeah, equivalent to host B doing the send and then host A doing the receive. The reason being that you can't do a receive, these sends and receives must be acting on different messages because you can't have the receive of, of, a, of the same message occur before the send. So if, if these are operations on different messages, then they're gonna commute. So the result of that, put these things together, RA followed by PR or S from B goes to PR or S from B followed by RA. In other words, RA is a right mover because what are the cases? Uh, R commutes with all of these guys, in, including commuting with B's send to the, to the right. Similarly, if you have a PRS from B followed by a send from A, that's, that goes, that's equivalent to a send from A followed by any action from B because S is a left, so S is a left mover. So that tells you that you can, as long as your um, atomic action follows this pattern, you can um, reduce it to an, uh, as long as your purported atomic action follows this pattern, you can reduce it to, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, this, this, yeah. this sequence of sub-actions with no intervening actions from any other host and therefore it's gonna be atomic. So that's the basic stor story about, um, about uh, reduction and movers in the context of sending and receiving messages, which is very similar to the context for locks, but, but somewhat different. So at the time they wrote this paper, they couldn't actually prove that given um, this, this requirement, you would have atomicity. So they, what they do instead is they show that, they, they show uh, uh, on paper that if a host action satisfies this, has this property, then it's atomic, i.e. That, that you get reduction to work. So they don't actually pr prove that using, using the, yeah. Yeah, they're um, using their uh, automated proof generation and checking machinery. They basically are just using the argument that I that I just showed you. And then what's the, what's automated is the check that the code actually does satisfy this this um, this rule that that the that the host action consists of some sequence of R's and P's followed by a T a possible T followed by some sequence of S's and P's. And that's made by a paper argument. What's this? Oh, right. And, and the way that, so how do they guarantee that the, that the host actually got, does follow these rules? Here's the, the um, main loop of a host action. You start out with some initial state. Sorry, this is not the main loop for a host action. This is the, the entire host um, the top level uh, program. You start out in some initial state for the host. 
And then you have an infinite loop, which consists of set EV to, to what the events have been so far and set my IOs and, and introduce a variable my IOs, which we don't initialize. Then we do some next predicate. This is the host actually doing its work inside the box. We do some next predicate, which returns um, a new state and the IOs that it did. And then we assert that if we now look at the, the history of events, that's equal to what it was before concatenated with my, my IOs. And we also assert that my IOs satisfies the reduction obligation. So as I said, that's, that's the main loop that every host has to have. Yeah. And what makes one host different from another, they have different uh, next, next state actions, of course. Okay, so that is the, is the grand program for Iron Fleet. You start out with spec, you have a protocol level, which assumes uh, atomic actions in the hosts <clears throat> and a network that allows hosts to pass messages from one to another. Then you define the individual host atomic actions by sequential reasoning, which of course Daphne is good at. Uh, and you rely on reduction to, to justify the transition from the host to the host executing actions totally interleaved to the host executing the atomic actions atomically. The network is modeled just by a yeah. collection of EDP packets. And then you put the, all the host actions together with the network and show that that refines P. And finally you show that this distributed system refines the spec by composing these two refinements. Now would be a good time for people to ask questions if they have any. So it's interesting to compare this, this um, basic story with the Armada story. The Armada people are playing a somewhat different game because their goal is to verify more or less arbitrary hard concurrency programs. Hard concurrency programs are not very big, but they're extremely tricky. So they're, they're, they use um, much more uh, algorithm specific arguments to show the necessary atomicity. The, the, that is to show that the various actions actually are right movers or left movers. Here we have an extremely generic argument to show atomicity, which is simply that the receivers are, are right movers and the senders are left movers. And the internal actions uh, are both left movers and right movers because they own all the variables that they act on and no one else can touch them. Liveness. Liveness, I don't, you know, I've said before that I don't really believe in liveness because my basic story is that it's not, not very useful to know that the system is gonna deliver a result eventually. What you need to know is that it's gonna deliver it within two seconds or five minutes or whatever your time limit is. You don't wanna wait until next year. But, but um, perhaps because liveness is harder than safety, it's, it's very popular to prove liveness properties of, of concurrent algorithms. And sure enough, the, the uh, Iron Fleet guys are doing that. I'm just gonna say a couple of words about it. I'm not gonna go into any particular detail. Um, for liveness, we're li living in the state machine world. And typically a liveness argument for a state machine is ba based on some sort of fairness assumption. So what is a fairness assumption? It says something like, if some action stays enabled, it will eventually, eventually occur and there's different various different flavors of fairness assumption. The, simpl the simplest one is the one that I sort of just recited, which says if the action becomes enabled and it stays enabled, then eventually it will occur. Um, and that allows you to, to make, well, never mind what it allows you to do. <laughs> 
you can you can do that. Do liveness proofs that show that if these the if you if the action satisfy these fairness assumptions, then then various liveness properties will hold. That is, eventually something will happen. In the case of the replicated state machine, actually it turns out liveness is especially tricky, and it depends on some fairly complicated assumptions about what can go wrong, which I'll touch on a little bit in a minute. Okay, so now I want to talk some about the uh, about the two examples that that uh, they've worked out to show that their um, to show that their basic uh, scheme. Uh, works well. The first one is a is a Paxos based replicated state machine. So the idea, what's what is a replicated state machine? The idea of it is, you've got some deterministic machine which is going to do a sequence of commands. And what you'd like to do is make this fault tolerant by making several copies of it. But you'd like all the copies to do the same thing. So how are you going to achieve that? Well, you're going to make all the replicas agree on what the next command is. And then because the machine is deterministic, if they all start in the same state and they all agree about what the first command is, then the second state of all the replicas will be the same. And if they all agree about what the second command is, then the third state of all the replicas will be the same and so on indefinitely by induction. So if you get all the replicas to agree on the next command, then you can build this replicated state machine and it will have the property that they're all doing the same thing. So if you want to know what the commands did, you can consult any one of the replicas. And even if some of them fail, the rest of them, as long as you can continue to do this agreement thing, it will keep running and you'll be able to consult any replica to find out what happened. So that's the basic story of replicated state machines. And the tricky part, of course, is getting the agreement. Um, and the way that's typically done in the modern world is using the so-called Paxos consensus protocol which was invented by Leslie Lamport about 30 years ago. And he told me that uh, um, the reason that he actually invented it was that some of the people in the DEC systems research lab were trying to build a fault tolerant system and they wanted to have some property for their protocol. And he was pretty sure that it was impossible. So he set out to prove that what they wanted was impossible, but it turned out that it was possible. And here it is, it's the Paxos consensus protocol. So, Following it along these lines, what, what is the spec for I and RSM? Answer is the spec of, of the replicated system is the same. The output of the replicated system is the same as the output that a single machine would give running the same sequence of commands. A very simple minded idea. So the tricky part of it, as I said, there are some tricky parts that have to do with performance that we'll get to in a minute. But the tricky part that has to do with algorithms is agreeing on the commands. And what's the basic idea? Well, here's a story about how to agree on one command. Let's say the first command. Um, and it's a little bit confusing because the agreement mechanism also involves a sequence of some kind. But this is, this is not a sequence of the state machine commands. This is a sequence of rounds, so-called rounds or ballots, as Leslie insists on calling them. Um, the purpose of which is to agree on one command. And then we're gonna do the whole thing over again to agree on the second command. And we're gonna do the whole thing over again to agree on the third command and so forth. So here we're just agreeing on one command. And we do that with a sequence of rounds. And in one of the rounds, uh, somebody proposes a command, call it C. And then you try for a quorum of the so-called acceptors. And what well, the special properties of quorums are that two quorums have to, any two quorums have to intersect. So if you get a quorum of acceptors for a command in this round, you can't, can't also have a conflicting quorum of acceptors for some other command because those two quorums would intersect. And an acceptor can only um, accept one command in a particular round. So the two, there's two possibilities for what an acceptor. I don't know that, but I do have a story you might like. Alexa, stop. Did I say Alexa in there somewhere? I missed it. Um, so then the, there's two things that an acceptor can do in a particular round. It can either accept command C, or maybe acceptor is too close to Alexa. Maybe that's the problem. Um, the acceptor can either accept command C or it can abstain. 
if it knows about some late, and it's going to abstain if it knows about some later round. If you learn that there's a quorum for C, then that's the outcome of the whole thing. Now you know what the command is. If you, you find out that there's a quorum for it, and now you can go ahead and, and yeah. run that state machine command. If you don't learn that there's a quorum, which could happen, for example, suppose you have three machines A, B, and C, and uh, A and B both accept the command, but then A fails. Now you're looking at B, which has accepted the command, and C is, is maybe accepted some other command. Now you've got one, one, guy, one guy accepting command X and another guy accepting command Y, and you don't know what the third guy is doing because he's failed. So you, you might not succeed in learning a quorum for C. If you don't, if you, if you don't succeed, then what do you do? You try another round uh, for possibly for a different command because you might not know which, what, what was the command for the previous round. But the trick is if it's possible that you achieved an outcome in the previous round, yeah. then the, the command you try for in the next round has to be the same. So this is the, the, the whole trick of the, of the protocol. If, if, if the outcome might have been achieved, if you might have gotten a quorum, then you have to you know, stick, to, stick to that value. So it doesn't matter whether you know whether or not you know that you got a quorum in some previous round. If, if you might have gotten that quorum, then you have to stick to it. And the challenge of, you know, of um, proving the correctness of Paxos is to show that you're obeying this rule, which we're not going to do in detail, of course. So instead of going into those details, I want to talk a little bit about what the aspect of, of Iron Flute's RSM that's actually novel and interesting, which is not the proof of the Paxos protocol, but that's very uh, well-trodden territory. What's interesting about the iron, the whole Iron Fleet RSM it, it is that to get a, a good performing replicated state machine out of the basic story that I just told you, you need to do quite a lot of work. Um, you need to batch commands to amortize the cost of consensus. So, you, so you've got a whole bunch of people coming in trying to make things happen in this replicated state machine. The, by the way, the canonical example of a replicated state machine uh, is, a, is a storage system of some kind where the actions are write some value into a variable or write some value into a file. You have lots of files and, and you want the whole replicated highly available system to behave the same way as a single unreplicated file system, except that it doesn't fail. So you've got lots of read and writes on files. You need to batch those commands together because the you know, achieving consensus by running the Paxos protocol is somewhat expensive. It requires the replicas to exchange some messages and you want to do that you want to get as much mileage out of that as possible. Um, in the straightforward description of the Paxos protocol, you keep track of what each acceptor keeps track of what it did in all previous rounds. And there are, there are ways to um, truncate that arbitrarily long log of what happened in previous rounds to, um, to a single round so that you don't use up too much memory. Um, Typically, the way Paxos works, and certainly the way that the Paxos algorithm in, in uh, Ironfleet works, is that there's a so-called leader or a proposer here that's in charge of a particular round. And of course, it's possible for that leader to fail. And when that happens, you have to do what's called a view change to select another leader, um, since the one that's failed is not going to help you to make progress anymore. And you need to do, do that somewhat cautiously um, in order to figure out basically the way you know that the current leader has failed is that you don't hear anything from them and you have to figure out how long you should wait before you decide that the, hey, the current leader has failed and a new one should try. Um, the, the, the important thing about a replicated state machine is that it has a, it has a state that's being replicated and that state might be fairly large, but under normal circumstances, when all the nodes are working correctly, each one of them is maintaining its own copy of the state and executing the, the, the commands in order to do the updates to the state. 
But if, it, if the node becomes disconnected for a long time, it's going to miss out on a lot of commands. And it might become too expensive to execute all of those commands one after another once you become reconnected and find out what they all were. And in order to avoid that, typically um, practical implementations have a, have a so-called uh, state transfer operation that just retrieves the state from some other replica in order to avoid having to replay the entire log of, of commands. And so there's a, there's a so-called state transfer operation for that, which is, uh, which is somewhat complicated. And then finally, there's a re so-called reply cache to avoid doing unnecessary work. Uh, if you, if a command comes in, you find out what the reply to it should be and uh, send it back to the client that sent the command. Uh, the, of course, the reply message might get lost. So the client may, re may re try to run the command again. And, and you, you need to optimize that to some extent to avoid doing unnecessary work. So you do all of these things and you have a an amount of code that's much, much big, bigger than the basic code for the, for the Paxos protocol itself. Um, but of course, that's all sequential code because it's all being done within these, these atomic operations, sequentially executing atomic operations within the individual hosts. And so, yeah. so um, Daphne is good at verifying that kind of code. Liveness. Uh, there's a theorem that says that in a fully asynchronous system where you don't know how long it's going to take for messages to be delivered, and you don't have any way to find out for sure whether somebody has failed, um, consensus is impossible. This is the so-called Fisher-Lynch-Patterson or FLP result from about 40 years ago. So we're not gonna be able to prove in the asynchronous model that we've been using, we're not gonna be able to prove that the replicated state machine is live. In order to prove that it's live, you're gonna to have to have some more timing assumptions. And the idea of a liveness proof in this context is going to be that given additional timing assumptions, um, the, the, uh, the thing will eventually execute commands. And the rough form of those timing assumptions is that a quorum of, of acceptors stays accessible for long enough and doesn't get so overloaded, so overloaded that it can't get any work done. But the details of that are, are fairly complicated. And the paper actually uh, lays out what the details are, but it doesn't give any details about exactly what you would have to do in order to in order to show that that um, the protocol is live, given these assumptions. But roughly, intuitively, the notion about why it's live is that um, as long as a quorum of acceptors stays up, uh, the the proposer is going to send messages to those acceptors, get responses. Um, and discover, and, and, and it, as a result, learn that there is a quorum and the, be able to proceed. And that's A. And B, if the proposer fails, uh, you, you've got a, a, some other node is going to time out after a while, figure out that it should try to become the proposer and, and um, get the show back on the road. But as as you can probably tell from the vague way in which I've said this, the details are somewhat tricky. The other example that they give, which they give quite a bit less detail about because it's not as tricky, um, is, the, is, it, is the replicated, is the not replicated, but distributed key value store. Here, there's no issue about fault tolerance. The trick, you know, the thing that makes this, um, this thing non-trivial is that they want to be able to rebalance it. So if we, yeah. if um, you're feeding keys into this key value store, and you have made a deci decision about how you're going to divvy up the keys among the different hosts, it's possible that uh, that won't be. It's possible that, that you'll end up in a situation where one of the hosts is getting most of the work, and the rest the rest of them are not working very hard at all. And under those circumstances, you're going to want to rebalance. And um, to make this a little bit more concrete, um, suppose that we're trying to keep the, the whole key, 
if you um, implement the key value store with hashing, then you can make it very unlikely that this is going to happen by having a good hash function that randomizes the keys. Um, but if you want the, the key value store to be sorted so that you can say, give me all the keys between A and B reasonably efficiently, then you can't use a hash function. You have to use some sort of um, tree structure, in which case uh, you definitely have to worry about the, the data, danger of having a hotspot. If it turns out that all the keys are between uh, 1 million and 2 million, then the one host that's serving that range is going to be doing all the work and all the other hosts will be idle. And under those circumstances, what you want to do is split up the 1 million to 2 million range and um, divvy it up um, among all the hosts. So that's the part that's non-trivial is the rebalancing. Other than the rebalancing, it's it's just about sequential reasoning, reasoning for having a reasonable data structure on each individual host, plus a reliable messaging scheme so that when you do have to do the rebalancing, um, you can do it reliably. And, the, and so that, that um, is based on one key invariant. And the invariant says that every key in the system either belongs to a single host or it's sitting in a, in a packet that's in flight that will eventually be delivered to some host that will, that will then own the key. So this has very much the same flavor as the lock spec that we looked at uh, an hour ago, where if you remember, the idea of the lock spec was that uh, at any given time, there's one host that's holding the lock. The invariant says that there's exactly one host that's holding, there's at most one host that's holding the lock. But it's possible for the hot lock to be in flight, remember, between one host and another, in which case, if no host is holding the lock, then there's going to be some packet that is, uh, that is in the process of transferring the lock. Similarly here, with the key value store, you're going to have an invariant that says that every key either belongs to one host or is in some in-flight packet that's in the process of, of transferring the key from one host to another. Uh, in Iron KV, the, the, this messaging is uh, significantly more complicated than it is in the lock story that we were just looking at, because the assumption is that that the network is not reliable. Network is UDP, so it can drop packets. So you have to have a, a reliable yeah. you have to have a reliable transmission protocol of some kind. Um, think TCP, simplified TCP, that sits on top. Of the of the UDP, in order to make it make it so that um, when, when we say that there's an in-flight packet here, we don't actually mean that it's guaranteed that there's a packet that is on the network in flight. It may be that the packet that was put into the network has been lost, and and um, it's going to it's waiting to be retransmitted from the host that's 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 transmitting it. So there's actually a, a fair amount of, of machinery reasoning involved in, in um, reducing the actual communication mechanism to this simple-minded story that I, that I gave here. The paper says, and they don't give into any real details, that there's one tricky data structure in this, in this implementation, or maybe I should say, there's one tricky piece of reasoning to show that they have a finite representation of what the spec says is an infinite map from keys to hosts, which of course in, in practice you want a map that's not only not infinite, but, uh, but also is, is yeah. reasonably efficient. So it works on ranges of keys, not on individual keys, for example. If it just were going to work on individual keys, it would be, it would be fairly simple because it would just have one entry for each individual key in the map. Which, and since yeah. the capacity of the of the uh, entire key value store has to be finite, th those maps are going to be finite, but they're going to be impractically large. Okay, so what have we done so far? We've we've understood the basic story of Iron Fleet, which is this five step story. You have the spec, you have the protocol level with host host messages. Yeah. you have individual hosts that are doing atomic actions. You have a network full of UDP packets, and then you put the hosts together 
with the network to show that it refines the, the um, uh, protocol level uh, implementation. Whenever you're doing one of these verification things, it's important to understand what it is that's actually being verified and what it is that you're taking on faith. So what are we taking on faith here? First of all, of course, we're taking on faith the spec for the system and also the spec for the main event loop. You have to believe that those are correct. You have to believe that the network doesn't tamper with packets. That's not a, that's a, yeah, something that we normally don't worry about um, because we know a very, a very simple way to make sure that the packets don't get tampered with, which is that you include within some sort of cryptographic message authentication code that the receiver can check. And that, that reduces the, the probability that any um, accident or, or malice could tamper with the packet yeah. to, to some arbitrarily low level. Uh, we are assuming that the Daphne uh, verification system, the .NET net compiler and runtime, the underlying Windows operating system and the underlying hardware are all working correctly. And uh, along these lines, an earlier piece of work that these guys did called Ironclad has shown how you can take the Daphne code that you've verified into verifiable assembly code in order to avoid dependencies on the you know, that .NET compiler and runtime or the underlying Windows OS. Of course, you can't avoid a dependency on the underlying hardware because the best you can do is to run this assembly code on the bare metal. They don't do that in this in this project, but they did show how to do it. Um, you have to believe in the paper proof or hand waving proof or whatever you want to call it that yeah. obligation implies reduction. Although subsequently, um, I was looking for a reference for this, which I did not find. But subsequently, um, these authors have actually pushed that proof through in Daphne. And as we were discussing in the context of um, in the context of Paxos, uh, proving liveness properties may depend on further possibly complicated assumptions about fairness, which you know, because of results like Fisher and Patterson that say that simple assumptions about fairness in a fully asynchronous system are not sufficient to guarantee, to guarantee liveness. Okay, so that was assumptions. Uh, finally, there's a sizable section uh, in this paper, which I think is actually actually quite important about pragmatics. Uh, if the goal uh, is to actually um, systematically produce verified impl implementations of reasonably complicated things that you might want to actually run, um, it's not enough to do, just be able to do it as a tour de force. There, there are a number of practical considerations that you have to take account of. Um, and experience that these guys gain in the course of doing this project. So one um, perhaps obvious point is you need verified libraries. Uh, and they mentioned three examples of such library components that, where you do the verification once and then you can rely on the, on the abstraction without having to redo, redo it for, um, for your next project. One of them is the concrete to abstract refinements for common data structures like sequences and, and sorted things and, and um, sets and, and so on and so forth. A uh, second one is marshalling. Uh, gi given this model for the network at, you know, as, a, as just carrying UDP packets, um, if you actually want to send any data from one machine to another, you have to turn it into a byte sequence then you can deliver the byte sequence in UDP packets, and then you have to turn the byte sequence back into some abstract, more abstract data structure at the other end. So those operations of serializing and parsing are called marshalling, and they've built themselves a, a library that can, can uh, marshal uh, sequences and records and sort of the, the common co coin of programming. And thirdly, um, they have li libraries that allow you to um, verify or maintain certain properties of sets like like how many elements there are or or is this sequence sorted things like that a second pragmatic point that 
is very easy to remember and work with once you get used to it, but it's, it can be a little bit difficult at first because it's, it's so um, contrary, and to, contrary to any notions of practical implementation. Is this notion you know, that you can have um, ghost variables of arbitrary size in which you can maintain a, a permanent history of everything that's happened in the, in the algorithm. Uh, and the co concrete example of that that they rely on very heavily uh, in these iron fluid applications is the network messages. So they keep a ghost variable which gives you a permanent record of all the network sends and receives that have occurred. And that means that um, abstraction functions and, and um, invariance and so forth ha have a very convenient way of um, anchoring themselves in, in the things that actually happen concretely, yeah. but are not are no longer part of the directly part of the concrete state. The third point they make is that internal to a single host where you, you, know, you get to do the sequential reasoning, um, it, it often works out well to first show, write the um, code for the for an atomic action in functional form, and, and then as a separate enterprise refine that to imperative code, which is typically more difficult to reason about. Fourth point, um, most of the paper kind of has the flavor of, well, we've got this wonderful Daphne uh, verification system, which is backed up by the magic Z3, Z3 uh, uh, SMT uh, solver. And we just have all these things that we need to verify, but we just throw them at, at this automation and it, 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 um, and it works by magic. There is one section that explains that that's not really true. Um, it, it makes a big difference exactly what sorts of things you throw at the at the uh, automatic at, at the automatic throw at Z three, and if you choose unwisely, then Z Z three will run for a long time, maybe a much longer time than you have patience for. So, so it, it's yeah. It's definitely an art to learn how to drive the thing so that you don't ask it to do things that, will, that will, it will find to be too hard. And they give a bunch of, example, of, of examples in a very informal way of things that you might need to do in order to keep Z3 out of trouble. And the, you, you can think of them all as being basically annotation on the Daphne code that that give Z3 some guidance about what, what it should try, especially when it's being asked to deal with quantifiers. It, this is not really different in flavor from the situation that you have in, in, the, in a, a cock-based system where you have uh, more or less powerful tactics that um, are capable of dealing with certain things automatically, but they have limitations. Um, in, and the limitations can take one of two forms. The form in which we see the limitations of the tactics in the lab work for this course is that the tactics are not that powerful. And so you may very well find, you often find that if you know, even though something may be fairly obvious, there's not a tactic like Leo that will just prove it for you. You have to futz around and lead cock by the hand through the proof. Um, the other possibility is that you have a much more powerful tactic, but it might be it might run too slowly, uh, and then, then you have to learn how to how to. Um, then you're in a situation that's more like the situation that the that the Daphne uh, user is in, where you have to learn when to apply the tactic and when to back off, or give it more information, or hold its hand more carefully. And the final uh, pragmatic point is. Um, how does all this work out? Would I ever actually want to build a system this way? Well, they say they they have about four times as much code as they have in an unverified system. And they also, they don't quite say this, but it's also true that you need verification experts to push something like uh, iron RSM or iron KV through. Uh, if you just take ordinary, reasonably well-qualified developers and turn them loose, they're almost certainly going to find themselves baffled by the inadequacies of the verification system. It's a long way from being 
fully automatic. And, and there aren't any straightforward uh, rules about how you can write your code so that the automatic mechanisms will always work. Certainly, you wouldn't be able to do that and also uh, achieve the performance goals that, that these guys have set themselves. We're going to be reading some papers uh, later on in the course that, uh, that are more automatic. And you'll see that the price you pay for, for greater a greater degree of automation is more constraints on the form that, that, your, code, that your code can take. And we're actually, of course, we're seeing some of that here because they've imposed one very severe constraint on the form the code can take, which is you have to package everything up into atom atomic actions of hosts and um, network messages interchanged between the hosts. You can't have any more complex forms of communication um, between the hosts. And with that, that's about all that I actually have to say, and I'd be happy to answer questions about this paper or anything else that, that our very small number of participants are interested in. One thing I'm a little bit curious about is how, uh, how exactly the re uh, reduction thing plays with the fact that the invariants that uh, you use to prove refinement, for example, hold at the ends of these atomic steps. So like, for example, I could write down a invariant that says that there's an even number of, you know, for every, for every uh, packet that says A, there's a packet that says B uh, in the network corresponding to it. And my methods could send A, then send B uh, every single time. And uh, I would be able to prove the invariant uh, at the end of this like atomic method even though it's not literally true that at any moment of real time, if I look at the network, I will see this invariance having been met. So I'm trying to figure out like why that isn't really a problem in, well, the, in reality. Yeah. I think that the whole scheme is based on the idea that you have code for a single host uh -huh. and you show that that refines a spec for the hosts where all the actions are atomic. Uh -huh. And having shown that, now you can pr proceed to do the rest of the proof, get, treating the actions as atomic. Uh -huh. So maybe another answer is, I think more- And why this, do, by the way, why this doesn't work for Armada, I don't understand. One thing I wanted to say is actually Moore's is like typically in this class, we've looked at these relate state relation correspondences where some code state corresponds to a spec state and you keep stepping that along. And I think actually Moore's is not that kind of a layer correspondence. Moore's yeah. talks directly about trace inclusion. Right. I think when you apply Moore's, you're not actually demonstrating how code and spec states correspond to each other when you're moving these operations around. Right, right. And as a result, you don't have to worry about what invariant is satisfied by the code level state before you do the reordering. Right, because, so, yeah. yeah. So I guess I'm trying to think like, uh, I'm trying to think like how that affects what the spec really says because the spec isn't saying that at like any moment of real time, if I look at the, the code state, that such and such thing will be true. And I guess the spec relations don't really treat the code state as an externally visible thing. So I guess it's but okay. The spec is not an invariant. The spec is a behavior. Sure, I guess the spec isn't an invariant, but I think uh, you're, you're, you're proving the spec in a setting where you can assume that these steps really are atomic. So like I could refine, so as my spec, I could say that I have a sequence uh, you know, two sequences of, of the A packets and the B packets that are the exact same size. And I require as my spec relation that uh, all the physical A packets uh, map into this A, you know, this abstract A thing and same for the Bs and assert that there's the same number of both of them. And that's like basically true. Like if you run both the sends physically, but not like 
literally true at that intermediate point, I guess. So I think here's the top level argument, right? Like the top level argument is trace inclusion, not any kind uh -huh. of state correspondence uh -huh. and not any kind of an invariant. That's the true for every system we've considered. I see, I see what you're and saying. And most of them directly jump into an invariant as immediately the way to prove it. But here the argument is, first off, the trace inclusion holds between the real execution and the mover reordered execution. And then you use invariant as a proof technique from that reordered execution up to the spec. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And if you wanted to, you could, you could, it would be quite ugly. Yeah. You could push this in yeah. very, yeah. you could push this invariant all the way down to the individual actions of the big atomic action, but then it would get quite messy because it would be full of if PC is equal to so and so, then this and that and the other thing. Right, right. Yeah. It, would, it would be a much more complex version of the of the story that we saw with the locks and with the with the key value store about oh yes, it's yeah. and it's not quite true that there's, there's exactly one host that holds the lock, yeah. lock or owns the key. Right, it right. Might be in flight in a packet. Right. And you you just have much much more of that if you want to yeah, want it to push the to push things in that direction. And Armada has the exact same story too, that you don't just do one mover argument. You need to do several arguments that are based on say invariance or like ghost variable introduction before you can do a mover argument. I think it's just a little bit stranger in Ironfleet because the layering is so crisp. There's just two layers. Right. Um, whereas the whole story in Armada is that you can introduce these things and there's gonna be many of them. Right. Right. I think that the, the lock example, although it seems trivial, is actually a very good one to keep in mind because it's this basic idea that the, the, the simplest story can be, be elaborated in some fairly um, simple way that ca captures the essence of, of what it takes to get. You know, tell a complete story it is really, it, that idea is captured in this notion that, that um, what you care about might not just be in the host, it might also be in flight. And of course, as I mentioned before, that might come back down to, at a, at a when you do a further refinement, it might come back down to, to its, you know, being in the host sitting in some retransmission buffer. But from a pragmatic point of view, it's really important to be able to prove that certain things are atomic and then stop worrying, stop having to worry about the internal details. If you don't have that kind of modularity, then you're never going to be able to do anything you know, that has more than 50 lines of code. Right. Other questions? Oh, people have fled. Okay, then I guess we're done for today and we're gonna see a more automatic scheme next Tuesday. <laughs>